Well, it's that time of year. For what you ask? For Paleo Rewind, of course. For all those who don't know, the secret cabal of Paleo YouTubers come together in an unholy ritual in December to talk about all that has happened in the paleontological world for that year. And I have been picked to go over the discoveries that occurred in the latter half of November. It's an exciting time filled with some pretty special discoveries that I am excited to talk about. So let's dig right in. Fossils of a coelacanth hailing from Cretaceous, Texas were discovered. Now, for those who are a bit out of the loop, you might remember coelacanths best as living fossils. As the tale goes, coelacanths are an ancient type of fish who evolved 400 million years ago that were long thought to have died out 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period, but were rediscovered floating around the ocean minding their business, oblivious to the fact that we all thought they had been taken out along with the dinosaurs. Of course, living fossil is a bit of a misnomer. These creatures do evolve over millions of years, pretty significantly in fact, although it might just not be superficial. For instance, I wouldn't judge you for confusing a modern coelacanth with the newly discovered prehistoric coelacanth who swam the Mesozoic oceans millions of years prior. The new species is a member of the genus Mawsonia, and it was a big one, reaching approximately 1.5 meters in length although other species of Mausomia could reach a terrifying 5 meters. This new species is also special because it is a rare example of a Mausonia genus from North America. Most are from Gondwanan waters, Gondwana being the southern continent in Mesozoic times. This coelacanth is also the youngest coelacanth fossil from Texas, coming in at a ripe 98 million years old. Look at this pinecone in amber. Not only was this pinecone lucky enough to get trapped in amber for eternity, but it is the first example of a special behavior never before seen in fossilized plants. You see, most seeds won't germinate or grow until they fall off of their parent plant, or leave the parent fruit. But sometimes the seeds just can't wait, and begin the germination process while still on their parent plant. This process is called precocious germination also known as vivipary, and usually occurs in various types of fruit. But it is incredibly rare in pine cones. In fact, pine cone precocious germination has only been officially described once by science, according to Professor Poinar, who described the piece of amber. So the fact that this pine cone seed started sprouting and was trapped in amber for 40 million years to be the first fossil plant to show vivipary is truly an incredible stroke of luck. I know what question has been plaguing your mind as of recent. What really is the transition from snake to lizard? When is something just a normal snake or a really long lizard? After all, this is a lizard, so is this. Where does the transition begin? This query about the origins of snakes and when they break off from lizards has stumped scientists for many years. Then came Tetrapodophis amplectus, a small aquatic reptile from 110 million year old Brazilian rocks. After the discovery of Tetrapodophis in 2015, the paleontological world thought they might be getting somewhere, as the animal appeared to be a primitive snake that still had vestigial limbs, and the creature was dubbed the first snake. Yet a new study disproves this supposed missing link between snakes and lizards. Although the animal does possess the characteristic long, spaghetti body of serpents, other anatomical traits reveals Tetrapodophis was instead a type of marine lizard known as a dolichosaur unrelated to snake ancestors. The main factor that changed these scientists' minds was the features of the skull, and after further examination of it and the mold around the skull, revealed it shared no similarities with snake heads. So with the lead of the tiny tetrapod office being thrown away, the mystery of the first snake remains even more difficult than it once was. This little dinosaur, Berthosaura leopoldinae, was found in Brazil. Hailing from the early Cretaceous, Berthosaura is a dog-sized, agile herbivore or omnivore descended from what else but giant, ferocious predators. The new species is a member of the enigmatic Noosaurid group, who are part of the larger theropod group Ceratosauria, who already contain the other interesting group known as Abelosaurs, who I've already gone over before. Noosaurids are some of the least well-known of any dinosaur group, made up of a vast array of small, agile animals 
whose most unifying trait seems to be the fact that they were trying to be the exact opposite direction that the rest of the ceratosaurs were going. The fact some are nimble, lanky-armed omnivores really seems to fly in the face of the burly and comically small-armed traditions of their cousins. Berthosaur takes this even further by being toothless, and instead possessing a beak. The other cool thing about Berthosaura is the fact it's one of the most complete Noasaurid skeletons to date, and could help us in further understanding these weird dinosaurs. Missouri is not the first place you think of when fossils pop into your mind. Missouri probably isn't the first place for basically anything else that pops into your head, except for maybe giant metal arches. But recently, several exciting dinosaur fossils have been excited 110 miles south of St. Louis. Digging up the specimen started in 2017 after a juvenile dinosaur was found 10 years ago. Now, multiple individuals of the same dinosaur species, Hypsobema missouriensis, have been dug up by a team led by University of Minnesota paleontologist Peter Makovicki. Makovicki said the animals probably were buried together because of some sort of mass death of a dinosaur herd, such as in a flood. The species Hypsobema, sometimes incorrectly referred to as Parasaurus, is a hadrosaur, known widely in popular culture as duck-billed dinosaurs, and could grow 10 meters in length and floated around 3 metric tons in weight. Dinosaur bones really are rare for Missouri, so this fruitful dig has been big news over there. Also the fact the animals died while in a group may reveal more things about herding behavior in dinosaurs. Moving on to another reptile of deceptive origins, we have new research on Ephigia. What type of dinosaur was Ephigia exactly? Well, the correct answer would be none of the above. Ephigia is a type of reptile that I like to call the almost dinosaurs. Creatures who are closely related or look very similar to dinosaurs, but are technically not. For instance, Ephigia is most closely related to crocodilians than it is to any dinosaurs. Ephigia and the rest of the almost dinosaurs also lived in the Triassic period, as the first actual dinosaurs started popping up and would eventually outcompete all of the copycats. Ephigia is also weird because although descended from crocodilians, it was an agile herbivore. The new research shows these animals had a weak bite force and shearing jaws, which would have made it most suitable for browsing on soft plant material. As weird as it sounds, there were actually many other herbivorous crocodilians during the Triassic, but most Triassic herbivores either dug up tough roots or fed on the tall trees. Ephigia's in-betweener status further illuminates the diversity of Triassic life. Ichthyosaurs, the adorable dolphin lizards of the Mesozoic Oceans. Pretty much the most family-friendly prehistoric animal behind Barney the Dinosaur. But as always, prehistory is more sinister than Land Before Time will have you believe. Cahitasuca is a new species of large ichthyosaur from the early Cretaceous, described from a one meter long skull. What separates it apart from other ichthyosaurs is the size and spacing of the teeth, which would have made it a ruthless predator of large prey, such as other marine reptiles. The name in fact means, quote, the one that cuts with something sharp, in an indigenous language in central Colombia where the fossil was found. Cahitasuca is a mighty predator, but also represented one of the last of the ichthyosaurs. The animal lived 130 million years ago in the early Cretaceous, where a shift was occurring in the Mesozoic waters, and the old ichthyosaurs were soon being replaced by new types of marine fauna. Ichthyosaurs wouldn't survive much longer into the Cretaceous, but at least they went out large and ferocious. Stop the hammering! A long, long time ago, a wise man once said, The Elasmotherium did have a horn, Adding on to its appearance was a truly massive horn, which might have grown as large as a man. Well, turns out he was completely wrong, along with many other people. The Ice Age rhino relative Elasmotherium, nicknamed the Siberian Unicorn, has usually been depicted with a striking giant horn on top of its head. But recent studies suggest this horn was not really a horn as much as it was a stump. After analyzing the skull of Elasmotherium, scientists came to the conclusion that a thin shell of horn-like substance covered the large dome over the animal's nose. The dome itself was made of bone, and allowed for extra space in the nasal cavity to increase sense of smell, or possibly function as a resonating chamber to enhance noises Elasmotherium made. I know this small curved horn covering doesn't really compare to the massive stalagmite that used to jut out of its head, but I still find it pretty neat. The study also suggests Elasmotherium possessed a hard growth on its muzzle, 
that alongside strong lips and neck muscles allowed the bees to dig up the underground parts of plants. This would give Elasmotherium a unique ecological niche not seen in the large herbivores of today. So sure it's lost its horn, but if this new study isn't disproven, it will make Elasmotherium a very distinctive animal, much different than even the rhinoceroses it is distantly related and usually compared to. So those are the major paleontological events of late November. An amount of these articles aren't new discoveries as much as they are correcting our old view of extinct animals. Paleontology is a scientific field that is prone to a lot of change. It's one of the things that makes writing a YouTube video trying to tell correct information on it difficult. You never know for how long you'll be correct. But that's also the beauty of the field. It's still growing, day by day. Just look at how much was discovered in a period of about two weeks. I'm glad that this science is always being updated and our knowledge is pushed further every year. And I'm glad I got to be a part of reporting that to you this year. Thanks for watching. My biggest thanks goes out to the PaleoTuber community who organized all of this, particularly Edge, who really held us together and who makes amazing content. If for some reason you haven't seen that channel, go over and look at it. Of course, thanks to all of the articles I used for this video's research, as well as all the artwork and photos, and thank you for watching. See ya.